Ghana, the reason behind the cutting down of trees is usually for charcoal, pasture for livestock, farms, urban or for industrial purposes. Deforestation defined as a conversion of forest land to other uses or a permanent reduction of canopy cover has attracted increasing international attention in recent years. Annually, the rate of global deforestation is around 13 million hectares, most of which occurs in the developing world. Forest loss in Africa is particularly troubling. Two-thirds of the continent's population depend on forest resources for income and food supplementation, and 90% of Africans use fuel wood and charcoal as sources of energy. Despite or perhaps because of this reliance on forest resources and non-timber products, deforestation in Africa is estimated around 3.4 million hectares. That's troubling, isn't it? Today on our blog, we are having a conversation on deforestation and its effects on the environment. Mustafa Seydou of Worldwide Fund for Nature, or WWF as they know it, and Eric Latte of Friends of the Earth would be on our blog. And colleague broadcast journalist Beatrice Senaju would also be joining the discussion. You are the reason why we blog all the time. So join our blog via Facebook, Twitter, or WhatsApp, and you will be part of this conversation. My name is Makafu Izimrani. Be my guest on iBlogger. I'll be right back. It is I blog on GBC24, and today we are blogging about deforestation and its impact on our environment. I'm just joined in the studio by colleague broadcast journalist Beatrice Senaji. Beatrice, welcome to iBlogger. Thank you. You know, you've heard of the saying that when the last tree dies, the last man dies. Yes, I have. Yeah. And you know, mm -hmm. uh, I was going through uh, some research and I realized that they said an estimated 18 million acres of forest are lost to deforestation. And I think that this is worrying, and this was according to the FAO. And deforestation is considered mm -hmm. to be one of the contributing factors to global climate change. Mm -hmm. And trees also offer, uh, they, they absorb greenhouse gases and, mm -hmm. and carbon emissions and they produce oxygen and perpetuate the water and water cycle by releasing water vapor and if we cut down all these trees and we don't replace them i think this is something that is worrying and as a country we have to be worried about it because uh, and sometimes too, you hear this ngos and governments on tree planting even though we plant them how how is it so is it solving the problems because we cut down these trees for for the, um, some people say they need the um, the space for urbanization because they need the lands for buildings and all those things if you if you are just wasting the land for buildings and other things without reserving the forest i think this is something that is not right yeah and uh you know uh, we we cut down these trees also for uh, timber. We cut them down for firewood, etc. You know, one thing that uh, bugs my mind is that we've been encouraging people now to, especially in the rural areas, to switch to LPG. But the price of LPG has gone up. Yes. So are we not in effect telling these people to go back to cutting down our trees, our trees for charcoal, for, for et charcoal et and all you know? that? And you know, yeah. uh, we, uh, we have so many effects when it comes to. Uh, uh, deforestation, mm. loss of species. You know, um, most animals and plants li live in the forest. Mm. And as we cut down these trees, where they are losing their habitats to mm. deforestation. And um, like some years to come, if we keep doing this, I don't think that we would even see um, animals for us to even say that we have um, this zoo and all that. We can't even get these animals to even beautify our zoos. And I think that this is something that government mm. and um, we all have to uh, contribute to the fact mm. in solving this. Oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm just joining the studio by uh, our guests who joined, uh, contribute to this discussions. They've been working in the forestry 
uh, or helping to conserve forests in Ghana. So I believe that they are going to share their thoughts with us. To my immediate left is Eric Latte from Friends of the Earth. Eric, you're welcome. And Thank the you. extreme left is Mustafa Seydou from WWF. You're welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, the first question I want to ask you is that, why are forests depleting so fast? Thank you, McCaffrey. Yeah. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, the reason behind mm. uh, fast depleting forests can mm. be attributed to uh, two broad factors. Mm. Uh, the first one we can attribute it to uh, uh, mm. certain key underlining uh, causes. Mm. Like you can mm. talk about uh, market failures, mm. you can talk about uh, mistaken policy interventions mm. by government and then the governance, uh, general governance failures in the forestry sector. And then socioeconomically, it's mm -hmm. also uh, the economic structure, how the, economic is, uh, the mm -hmm. economy is structured also contributes to uh, deforestation. And then number two, mm -hmm. you can also attribute it to uh, direct causes like mm -hmm. primary logging, mm -hmm. illegal logging, so I think basically these are the main causes of uh, deforestation. And you, for instance, being a friend of the earth, <laughs> so which yes. means that deforestation is of it uh, it to con our con concerns you so much. And what is your organization to do uh, doing to help stop this trend? Yes, um, Friends of the Earth, Ghana over the years, uh, has embarked on uh, various projects that involved. Uh, reforestation and afforestation. Mm. We have also been involved in uh, the current governance reforms mm. or legal reforms that is going on in the forestry sector at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment we are implementing about two projects that mm -hmm. are directly linked to supporting the government of Ghana and Forestry Commission for that matter mm -hmm. in uh, making efforts or supporting uh, mm. the idea of reducing illegal logging mm -hmm. and ensuring that mm -hmm. the laws governing the mm -hmm. forestry sector mm -hmm. are strictly enforced. Mm -hmm. So we have projects, uh, two projects mm -hmm. that have been uh, financed by the European Union mm -hmm. in support of that. Mm -hmm. But let me say that uh, uh, most of our initiatives have been externally driven, or mm -hmm. let me say project driven funded by donors, mm. but their uh, focus has changed mm. in recent years. Previously, uh, donors were emphasizing more on afforestation, tree planting, mm. reforestation, yeah. but I think attention has shifted from the physical planting of the forest mm. to ensuring that governance is uh, reformed in the mm. forestry sector. But when if you we talk reform about the governance, governance, don't we still need to plant trees so that we replace the ones we've, lo we've lost? We need to. Mm. And that side is not uh, forthcoming. Mm. So it's another issue uh, that we need to mm. uh, tackle. Oh, okay. Yes. okay. Let me go to Mustafa. Mustafa, it is estimated that we lose 2.19% of our forest cover in Ghana every year. Projecting that into the future, <laughs> in the next how many years we are going to have no forest in Ghana? Isn't that scary? And why are we allowing it to happen this way? If it's happening, we are losing 2.19 every year. It means that, and we've been talking about deforestation for years. Since I was a little boy, I was in school. It was part of the courses we're studying in school. So it is not a new uh, problem that we're encountering. Why are we losing the fight to deforestation? Okay. Thank you. I think it's scary. Mm. Uh, and it's scary in every respect if you look at it. But the reason, I think I will not be able to undergo through the underlying process why deforestation is happening. Mm. But I will tell you some of the factors that are leading to deforestation mm. in, in, in Ghana now. The number one cause yeah. of deforestation in Ghana is actually agri. Yeah. If you know how we do farming over the years, mm. it has either been slash and bend, mm. which <laughs> means that you cut everything down, mm and burn everything. Mm. 
and actually the law permits you to cut everything down mm -hmm. as far as it is not a forest reserve or a protected area yeah. and as far as you're not going to convert it for commercial purposes okay so if you're farming if you have a piece of land to farm you can, cut everything, need, down. You can cut everything down mm. so this is another point mm. second one is that 90 percent or probably up to that mm. number we have the pine on wood okay so wood remover for charcoal is mm -hmm. a major contributing factor. Aside that, if you, uh, everybody in Ghana uses wood. Yeah. Uh, one way or the other, if you go to everybody's room, You'll there's furniture. Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, how we get the wood is something nobody questions. Mm -hmm. You have, you, you, if you be surprised to know is that majority of the wood we use in Ghana are illegal. Mm -hmm. Illegal in such that they are not cut in accordance with the prescribed laws. Okay. So logging is mm -hmm. a second logging and wood remover, mm -hmm. whichever you look at it, is a second major cause of deforestation in Ghana. A third part is that is money and then illegal money that has actually come mm -hmm. to stay now. Mm -hmm. Uh mm -hmm. is is unfortunately is even officially two percent of our forests are allowed to be logged. Mm -hmm. uh, to be mine, okay. excuse me, to be mine, two percent yeah. official allowed to be mine. Unofficially, anybody can go there mm -hmm. and do the mining. Mm -hmm. The third part is that uh, infrastructure development. If there is a road going to connect communities, it doesn't matter whether there is a forest. You clear it, clear, yeah. and you have to salvage the forest, and then, and then, and then, and then what? And then mm. You salvage it, but you don't plant it. Mm -hmm. That's after that. So these are the major causes of deforestation. And yeah. you ask the second part of the question, why we are losing the fight against deforestation. Yeah. It's actually, uh, um, there are a number of things. Yeah. Uh, first is that there's, there's a need to be a behavioral change before you can, you can actually change the way mm. we use, um, we, we deforest. Yeah. For example, if we don't change the way we use energy, yeah. Then you're not going to be able to reduce the amount of people who use wood mm -hmm. and if that doesn't change then the rate of deforestation from the wood remover side is mm -hmm. going to continue if we don't change the way we do farming mm -hmm. then we're not going to be able to win the the fight against deforestation, deforestation. from farming yeah. and as far as people are going to be able to, to shift and to cut down the tree as they want mm -hmm. then we're not going to be able to win the war on that mm -hmm. if you're not able to regulate the mining sector mm -hmm in terms of where they should be mining and where they should not be mining, mm -hmm. then everything under the cover of forest is going to be going. And let me tell you, almost every forest reserve is under some form of mineral. Yeah. And if we were going to remove all of this, mm -hmm. because probably minerals are fetching higher, then we're not going to be able to win the war. And so uh, these are uh, some of the major mm -hmm. issues we have. And until we change the way we do things in terms of doing mm. land use planning mm. and land use planning i mean knowing that this is for settlement this is for a greek this is for forest mm. this is for protected area and the other doesn't have to overlap the other mm. if we don't do that then of course it's the competition and probably the cheaters will win mm. and i mean the one which brings the most money will probably take over everything yeah and uh can we not say that we'll lay blame uh, to you organizations probably also working in the forestry sector or trying to help us prevent deforestation or help us to a forest? Because I know, for instance, Eric, your organization has been in existence for a very long time. You yes. know, and I believe you've been telling us about the harmful effects of deforestation, etc. And some are also of the view that you NGOs or organizations working to support those industries are just probably there for money to enjoy donor support etc but you don't really really influence change because if you are influencing change how come we are losing over two percent of our forest cover every year yes thank you i think this is a very uh, interesting <laughs> question uh, i must say that uh, ngos for that matter civil society organizations mm. working in the forest sector has contributed so much I mean, the responsibility uh, solely lies on the government institution that mm. has been mandated mm. to manage the resource on behalf of the people. Mm. And uh, I can say on authority mm. that 
uh, a chunk, appreciable amount of the funding mm -hmm. that has been received by Ghana mm -hmm. went to government. It didn't mm -hmm. come to uh, civil NGOs. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I'm not blaming government. Government has also uh, played its role in ensuring that our forests uh, are managed and protected well. But uh, government, I mean, could have done better. Mm. NGOs have also contributed their quota to uh, protecting the forest. Mm -hmm. We have uh, quite a number of achievements to our credit. We like. Uh, we have a civil society platform called Forest Watch Ghana mm -hmm. uh, that has been very uh, active and it has played mm -hmm. a central role in uh, influencing the formulation of the 19, the revision of the 1994 forest and wildlife policy. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. the policy uh, as it stands now contain mm -hmm. uh, elements that actually reflect mm -hmm. the need or elements that will help uh, meet the current uh, uh -huh. challenges that uh -huh. are confronting the forestry sector. Uh -huh. So I think uh, from where we sit, NGOs, our role or uh, our responsibility is to play a watchdog role to ensure that uh, government is, uh, for that matter, forestry commission is put on its toes uh -huh. to do the work that uh, it is mandated or it has been mandated to do. Um, but um, okay, uh -huh, I'm listening. Yes, but uh, NGOs are not implementing institutions. Uh -huh. uh, all the funds that come to NGOs are used to support government. Uh -huh. uh, our role is just to influence, to ensure that government does the right thing. Uh -huh. That will benefit uh -huh. uh, the local people. Uh, Mustafa. Uh, Eric was talking about some of the successes chalked by yeah. organizations working in the forest industry mm -hmm. to help make sure that we don't lose our, yeah. our, our forests. But he said that the end justifies the means. Mm -hmm. yeah. You are claiming successes to yourselves, but in actuality, we are not saying it because you are still losing our forests. Yeah. Why is it so? Yeah. Okay, so I won't even... Um, um, I won't see and we yet. talk about come again. We talk about policy. Yeah, policies, <laughs> if not implemented, will just be gathering dust on yeah. our shelves. No, right. So the policy could be there. We could have the forestry and wildlife policy, but if at the end of the day yeah. we are still losing the vegetative, the forest cover, cover. then it's alarming. Because I was reading, uh, doing some reading before I came on the program, and out of uh, there's an organization called Wood Products Trade Group did a research in 2008, uh, uh, is it 2011, yeah. Mm -hmm. And out of over 65 countries, Ghana ranked very high, being the number one in losing our forests, except Togo and Nigeria, which <laughs> ranked higher than us. So, yeah. That's alarming. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. And then you know what? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let me start the, the, the question you asked at first. Okay. Uh, why maybe we've said we've chopped some success, but mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and whether we are contributing to mm -hmm. actually elevate the problem. Mm -hmm. So actually the question, your question is legitimate. Mm -hmm. I think that we have all not uh, been very successful mm -hmm. in, in helping to stop mm -hmm. the deforestation. Mm -hmm. In fact, like Eric said, our role is complementary mm -hmm. and uh, we will not um, presume or assume to be taking government's role of leading the process. Mm -hmm. But what we do is to be able to support government in or keep government in issues mm -hmm. ensuring that what they are mandated to do uh, they actually do it mm -hmm. having said that let me see uh, we are not necessarily uh, happy with the situation and that's why we continue to do what we've been doing if you think about the forest sector in general we've been, mm -hmm. we've been, we've been working there for quite some time and mm -hmm. as a solution oriented organization we've gone into all the sectors I've mentioned except mining. Mm. Then so illegal working, like you mentioned, we've done a lot of projects in making sure mm. that industry who are leading loggers in this country mm. actually go through a process of production the core certification. What it means is that your timber that is going to Europe mm -hmm. until it gets certified mm -hmm. 
-hmm. the market is not going to accept it as, mm -hmm. you know. But the market, like he mentioned, that mm -hmm. market is not perfect. There yeah. are some people who consume whatever you produce. There mm -hmm. are some people who say, until you go through a process of certification, we're not going to buy your product. But if I go, say, go to timber market to buy some wood, <laughs> so in some, so in how that, do I know it, whether it, that is okay, legally, no. it's legal or it's okay, not? Okay, that's, so that's, mm -hmm. that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is why I actually decided that I'm going to come to this program. Mm. Because what we thought is that mm. people, we buy left and right mm. on the market. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't even know whether it is legal or mm. illegal. But 80% mm. of all the wood on the mm. market, mm. timber market, mm. uh, on the roadside, 80% mm. are illegal. 80% of, of the wood you have on the road. All the wood you have on the street of Accra, on the street of Kumasi, on so How did whatever. you arrive at that statistic? Well, it, the fact is that most of the mm -hmm. legal wood in Ghana mm -hmm. are actually exported. Okay. So the majority that you see on the market are actually supplied by illegal chainsaw operators. Mm. Which means that illegal because you cannot, under current law, mm -hmm. use a chainsaw to split the wood into lumber. Okay. So anything that you use, anytime you use the chainsaw to split the okay. lumber, mm -hmm. it's illegal. Mm. It's against the law, and that makes it illegal. So why is the law not working? Well, the law is not working for a number of reasons, mm. and uh, it's a reflection of the kind of society we have, mm. that a number of our laws, it's not because we don't have laws, mm. a number of our laws are not enforced to the latter, and it's not only really peculiar to forestry, mm. and it's probably pronounced in terms of forestry because mm. uh, people have become sophisticated in terms of how they do the business, and there are people who are there to buy. But uh, you, but you NGOs are yeah. supposed to probably play a role akin to uh, uh, those of us journalists yeah. or those of us in the media as a sort of a watchdog role. Exactly. So if you are aware of the fact that 80% of all the uh, uh, the wood we have on the yeah. markets are locally illegal. are illegal, yeah. then are you, are, are you also not to blame partly because you are aware of this statistic and you are confidently giving me the statistic. Yeah. But uh, well, we are doing a mm. lot. And let me just tell mm. you, it's an NGO which mm. is actually starting the domestic market work mm. to make sure that every domestic wood is actually mainstream into mm. the legal process. Mm. Uh, one uh, NGO called Tropimos International. Mm. And if you guys government, they will tell you to go mm. to Tropimos International yeah. because they are leading this process to make sure that uh, people who are supplying the local market actually mm. go through that right process. Mm. Well, it's not talking about who should be leading this process. It should be government. Mm. And talking about should be supported. Mm. But I tell you, this is what is happening. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying that I'm not saying government is not doing something because recently government is actually putting up um, a procurement policy on timber and timber product, which means mm. that every government project that will use wood will have by obligation to buy legal wood. Mm. Previously, Government did not care where you buy your wood for, even if they finance your project, which mm. is contradictory in itself. Because yeah. what it means is that you use government money, but you could go to the market and buy the illegal mm. wood government itself is fighting. Mm. You know. But now government is changing it, and they currently coming up with a law that will mm. make every contractor under government public funded by public fund mm. compulsory to buy only legal wood. Oh, okay. okay. But that is not going to cover you and I. Mm, we don't go to government mm -hmm. to buy. So what we want to do, this is a communication process. Mm. And then to do that requires a number of consistency and a long-term communication mm. to be able to tell people that if you actually need legal wood, this is where you have to go. You don't have to go to the market or mm. to go to this place. But it takes time. Mm. It takes a lot of energy. It takes mm. a lot of money, mm. which NGOs do not, are not presupposed to, are not predisposed to have. Yeah. You know, it's a government effort that should be long-term. Mm -hmm. Government itself is struggling in terms of, you know, being able to make those communications. Well, I'll place on record here and, and now that we're supposed to have somebody representing government to exactly. actually explain some of these things to us from the Forestry Commission, but yeah. unfortunately, they were not able to turn up because of one or two reasons. And definitely, I think that this discussion must continue. We'll get them back here so that we are able to deal with some of these issues that must go, questions that must go to government and what the government's role in trying to, you know, ensure that we protect our forest reserves. But now we, we know also that, you know, cut, one of the main reasons or another reason for us losing our forests is cutting down the trees for use as fuel. 
and uh, the alternative to that is the use of gas which i believe government over the years has been trying to encourage but unfortunately in recent years we've been seeing hikes in the prices of lpg gas which we use at home even for those of us in the urban areas it's getting expensive for us to afford how about those in the rural areas which means that they are going back to the use uh, cutting down trees for charcoal firewood etc how haven't you as organized uh, the ngos you know been concerned about this trend because if i can't afford lpg i'll definitely go back to the charcoal or firewood yeah, yeah. No, you're right and uh, mm -hmm. we, we've been very concerned mm. and uh, i just discussed that policy with uh, my colleagues in the office before mm. coming here mm. And well, government um, is a balancing act, mm -hmm. and let me just say, and I'm not going to put mm -hmm. squarely the blame mm -hmm. on all government okay. because mm -hmm. they have economy to money, mm -hmm. they have a country to run. Mm -hmm. But um, the mm -hmm. the fact is that uh, perhaps it mm -hmm. will take a number of uh, intervention. I don't see it as a single solution mm -hmm. to be able to even revert back into that process. Yeah. Definitely, it's going to have a trade-off effect on the amount of trees that people will cut. Mm -hmm. Which means that uh, increasingly, um, uh, people are going to be using more wood. Yeah. Um, that is not uh, something we can put our fingers and say probably to be attributable only to the increment uh, in terms of the gas prices. Of course. Because what's happening is that um, charcoal is not cheaper either, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to a craft. Mm -hmm. In the local, in the local where it is produced, it's cheaper. And for them, I think that for a very long time, they will continue to use charcoal. What we should complement, I guess, um, I heard government is going to supply um, cylinders, and free cylinders, and, free and, free and other areas, infrastructure. And but if you're gas. supplying free cylinders and we have to fill it with gas, which is so expensive, it's yeah. so counterproductive. Isn't I know, it? it's a mobile, it's very mm -hmm. analogous to the mobile mm -hmm. phone uh, yes. issues yeah. where. The issue of tax on talking mm -hmm. and people say, well, let's remove tax on the on the mobile handset. And once people are able to get it, then they will have the imperative to buy mm -hmm. more credit. Mm -hmm. You could look at it in that angle. But I think that have even putting the 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 those infrastructure in place, mm -hmm. we will still need to to put something in place in terms of charcoal production itself. Mm -hmm. The way we produce charcoal is so wasteful. Yeah. And so recently, a couple of organizations, including mine, mm -hmm. uh, at the Tubobu area, the Afran Plains, have started uh, doing what we call the uh, integrated king, charcoal king production. Mm -hmm. What it means that it's a, it's a specially designed charcoal production unit mm -hmm. that is uh, a number of folds more efficient mm -hmm. than the ordinary mount, conventional mount of production. Mm -hmm. And what we do is that we're not just saying that uh, we create this for you and you go to the bush and cut. Mm -hmm. We also establish a plantation, mm -hmm. fast growing species that mm -hmm. only takes about three years mm -hmm. to grow. Okay. To be able to produce charcoal. Okay. And we so those trees are specifically planted, planted for the production for of charcoal. It's a cashier. Okay. We're planting it for only three years. Okay. And within the three years, so mm -hmm. for each king, you mm -hmm. need about 30 hectares of okay. acacia. And that it takes only 10 hectares. For a year to produce in a year, so which, okay. which means that uh, if you divide it by tree, you plant whatever you cut. Mm. So the first year you cut ten hectares, you plant there. The second year you cut another ten hectares, mm -hmm. you cut, you plant there. The, the third, third year, year you, you plant. plant, and by the time yeah. you finish coming, you come back one, to the first exactly. one. Okay. And we think mm -hmm. that a method of upscaling it will be more dependent on people agreeing to plant the plantation. Okay. Otherwise, we're not going to put an integrated king, charcoal king production mm. and let you go to the bush and start cutting. Mm. Because that means that if you can put produce more efficiently, mm. you're going to cut more mm -hmm. and then sell more. Mm -hmm. But once we think that mm -hmm. you, the priority for you to be part of this process is actually to have the plantation mm -hmm. established, mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. uh, is and then we have an organization which is ready to supply the seedlings oh, okay. as part of their contribution to mm -hmm. the development of the area. Oh, okay. And we think that this is something that can be actually upscaled to other parts of the country. And in fact, okay. individuals can 
also can also participate in this. Because charcoal production is actually an income generation. Mm. Uh, aside the fact that it's causing havoc, mm. but people are still need charcoal. But if people are not willing to plant these trees, mm. right? Are they still not going to fall back on uh, extending this to no, the forest? No, definitely. Mm. People mm. will always want the cheap way. Mm. And the cheap way is uh, go to the bush and cut, cut it. it down. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that for us to be able to change as a nation, there is a need for some mind mm. change, behavioral change mm. in everybody, mm -hmm. in everybody the way we use. And just thinking about, you know, these trees they are cutting, they are older than you, probably even your <laughs> father. Mm -hmm. And, then, and when do you think, how long do you think you can continue cutting this? Mm. What about your children? Mm -hmm. uh, what are they going to be doing? Are mm. they going to be cutting the same trees? Mm. So it's something that we, and then Ghanaians, one thing I realize, and then, excuse my language, we have a short discount. We discount it very fast. Mm. Huh? If you ask somebody to even plant that tree year, they don't believe it. They will say, yeah. well, after the tree year, probably he will be dead. <laughs> Which, just forgetting that, it's an mm. investment for your children. Of and, uh, you know, uh, mm. There are people who are where they are now because their fathers and their, their parents actually did something mm. for the future. Mm. And I think that it's something that we have to be able to change people's mind, mm. to be able to appreciate that it's not all about you. Mm. It's about people you are leaving behind as well. Mm. So that if you have planned something that takes only three years to mature, then you shouldn't see it as dying tomorrow yeah. and therefore you'll not benefit from it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, let me just invite co a colleague Beatrice to come in. And Beatrice, you know, uh, one of the reasons uh, why we are losing our forests also is due to other human activities like galamsey and then illegal mining because most of our, our forests are very rich in mineral resources and uh, etc. How do you think that we can tackle this? You know, you know the gal this galamsey issue has become a big problem for us, not just for even forestry alone, but degrading the land, you know, etc. Yeah, it's true. We are losing it too, but I'm saying. Mm -hmm. This illegal mining, but I think that government alone cannot do do the uh, uh, stop them from um, doing that. And I think that we need uh, stringent measures. Uh, laws should be put in place to to combat this. Because if uh, when we say that we are stopping people from doing illegal mining, how are we how are we stopping it? it always we go there to educate them. We go there and we do stories and you know and just um, broadcast them on our various radio stations and television stations and I think that doing that alone is not helping I think that we should uh, if we put the laws in place I think we have to follow it we, we have to make sure that the laws work mm -hmm. and, and that when people know when someone knows that if I do this and I'll be in prison for let's say 20 years that is um, uh, equal to someone who raped some somebody mm -hmm. and I think that the person won't do that mm -hmm. so I think that we should we, it's not about putting the person in prison but after educating them I think that the, the, uh, the right things should be done. Yeah, and uh, coming back to uh, you over here to uh, uh, Eric, for instance, we don't often hear of people be, being prosecuted for uh, cutting down illegal uh, logging, etc. But I believe we have, we have, we do have laws in the statutes books that uh, have prescribed punitive measures for people who engage in this. Why is it not happening? Uh, as uh, yeah. friends of the uh, th point of view, th thank have you, you I, I wish trying to investigate this? Yes. I wish uh, the people invited or the person invited from the Forestry Commission was mm. here to mm. answer that probably will be the appropriate person. But mm. um, the little I can say mm. is that uh, the Forestry Commission mm. uh, about 30 years ago mm. had their own mechanisms of prosecuting uh, offenders, mm. those who commit various forest offenses, mm. and they lost that. I mean, the courts, they lost that opportunity. I mean, that can be attributed to one or two reasons. And the way the judiciary was handling mm. forestry cases was not uh, desirable mm. because uh, probably they didn't have uh, much knowledge on the forest laws and okay. uh, legislations. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I think last year, the Forestry Commission actually came up with this initiative of uh, training uh, its own staff mm -hmm. to lead the prosecution process. Okay. And I don't know to what extent uh, that is working, mm -hmm. but we are very hopeful that this new measure 
will help mm. all of us to um, ensure that the laws are working. Mm. And I must also say that uh, the Forestry Commission has not been without its own problems. Mm. I mean, it's sometimes it's find it's very difficult to prosecute its own people. Mm -hmm. I Who can sometimes say, probably collaborate yes, with some of these yes, illegal. Yes, I can say with all mm -hmm. uh, degree of certainty that the Forestry Commission and I mean there is ample evidence to attest to this fact. The Forestry Commission staff have been accused on several occasions of abetting and conniving mm -hmm. with. Uh, Timber contractors with community people mm. with uh, chiefs mm. to commit heinous forest crimes. Mm. So I think the challenge mm -hmm. to us uh, as NGOs, what we foresee mm -hmm. is that uh, the Forestry Commission hasn't, uh, haven't taken this giant step mm -hmm. of training its staff. The fear mm -hmm. we foresee is that they will not be able or they will not be bold enough mm -hmm. to prosecute their own people, okay. the big shots. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay, okay. And, uh, I believe you've heard about the Achimota Forest Reserve being converted in the near future into an eco park. When we come back, I won't take a quick break. When we come back, we'll discuss that further and what your take is on, on that. Well, the program is iBlogger on GBC24, and today we are discussing deforestation and its impact on our society. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. It's not mm. been okay. managed. Okay, vlog on GBC24, and the discussion is still been going on whilst we're on break. And of uh, concern to me, particularly, has been what the role, uh, the role of these uh, NGOs in trying to reduce uh, deforestation. Now, before I went on the break, I mentioned the uh, Achimota Forest being converted into an eco park. Many of us are alarmed because it means that trees will be cut down to convert it into an eco park and is that not and that's a, a a government decision anyway and is that not going to contribute to the deforestation because i've known the achimota forest since i was a little boy and what's your take as organizations working to ensure that we don't lose our forest and here we are a prominent forest reserve we have in the capital is going to go well if you ask me i don't think uh it's going to be a bigger problem like we are looking at it i think the the point is that in terms of uh, park management mm -hmm. and the design of it you're not going to do a very top clearing into an, an, an i mean into a bare land before you start planting mm -hmm. so you're going to be able to do so what we call the enrichment planting of the desired species mm -hmm. and and for me um if you compare Ghana to other countries, and, and it's a different subject, so much as mm -hmm. why you want to go there. Mm -hmm. In terms of having a park, and the park does not necessarily mean it's going to be like grasses. So that you could have all the trees that you mm -hmm. want to have. In fact, you just have to introduce other species of trees that are of Ghanaian origin to be able to complement the amount of trees in there. It's just that uh, they're not going to be scattered anyhow mm. so there will be some management of the trees there and for me it is going to create another level of of um it's probably will increase the biodiversity because you will probably bring more other species of bears that were not there mm. before because you're introducing different species of together but don't forget about it because this is in the middle of town mm. And I, 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 must, um, I can imagine the amount of pressure government is going through in terms of some people lobbying so hard for this to be released for some, some, some infrastructure, skyscrapers, that mm. will not be a park. But even and if the Echo Park, they are going to, there's going to be some infrastructure there. So well, which means that yeah, well, uh, still it's, we are going, it's going to affect the, well, the, the, the forest the stark, reserves. The stark reality is that mm. there's no nature without development. You cannot mm. sustain nature without development because mm. For everything we do, there should be a human element of it, mm. you know, and that means that uh, the the old conventional way of conservation, where you put people aside and put the animals or the trees aside, mm. is not going to happen, mm. and that's why we are not succeeding. <coughs> mm. So you may have to be able to manage people and nature, mm. and that means that uh, if we don't make this pack 
an income generating pack, mm. then something will take over. So we, we generate income at the expense of of our forest, not so high diversity well, conservation. Well, yeah. well, 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 the fact is, yeah. is, a, is a balancing act, mm -hmm. and it's a balancing act, and in this world, in terms, even if you want to manage for it, it has to be a trade-off of certain mm -hmm. level. What I'm saying is that but but you if, don't have to mm -hmm. obturate, uh, I mean... But if you're making these compromises, then of course you're making excuses why we should gradually lose them. That's why probably yeah. we are not no. winning the war against deforestation. No, but uh, like I'm saying, it's, it's, you cannot prevent every little bit of, uh, I mean, biodiversity being lost. You, you will lose some. But the question you have I to ask is, some. what's the problem with Achimota Forest? Well, Achimota Forest <laughs> is that, well, and then you mm -hmm. probably know about three, four, five years ago or mm -hmm. more than that, that there was a news item that this was going to be converted into, into uh, um, a shopping mall. Yeah. Okay. And I'm telling you that, and I don't have for fat, but I can imagine. So the solution to that is the that, solution okay, is that we convert it to a park and we still destroy <coughs> the forest. That's, that's ad hoc, isn't no, it? No, well, if you call it a forest, and I'm saying that the structure is not going to change so much, but it's just that. It's but it will change to an extent. Yeah, it will change to an extent. But so it's why do that they're going to be able we, to introduce. Why, we, why do we tamper with it? No, well, they're going to be able to introduce even more animals into it. Mm. They're going to be able to introduce more animals to it. By and destroying, and by, no, you're not by causing destruction. Well, <laughs> you have to do it, and let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. If you go to Cote d'Ivoire, Abuja, mm -hmm. there's a forest reserve in the middle of Abuja, mm -hmm. which um, which is used for recreation, but it's also it's a forest reserve. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's in the middle of a forest reserve doesn't mean that you should not be able to introduce the ecosystem element.